think he holds a BA in MA in history? I don't think so. I think that's just enough. Uh, they, they refunded Dean of Pride Day. They refunded Dean of Pride Day since 1998. And before that, he was the director of the Gretchen Pickenbaum, popularly, popularly known as Robinson for 12 years. Ramaz KJ, Virtual Community University Learning. We begin as we do each of our learning sessions uh, with uh, wishing all those who are ill in the community and in the larger community a refuah shlema and express our condolences to all those who have lost loved ones during this very, very difficult time. We all stand together. We want to thank and recognize the amazing work of our health professionals who are on the front lines and literally doing God's work. Keep healthy and safe. Thank you. And now, to today's special opportunity, a chance to hear an outstanding presentation and take a virtual walking tour of the Warsaw Cemetery. I have actually had the privilege of walking that cemetery with Dr. David Bernstein several times. He literally brings the world that was alive as he speaks about each of the personalities who are buried in that cemetery. The world that was a virtual walking tour of the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. He will share the lives of some of the great Polish Jewish rabbis, leaders and writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, reflecting the mosaic that was Polish Jewry as it confronted modernization. Dr. David Bernstein, who together with his wife, Ricky Bernstein, and their wonderful family, were members of the Ramaz KJ community for many, many years. David is currently the Dean of Pardes. He has been the Dean since 1998. And before that, he was very famously the director of Midrash at Lindenbaum, known as Gravenders to many of us, for over 12 years. Before making Aliyah in 1984, David was the director of informal education at Rumaz and also created and taught a two-year curriculum integrating world and Jewish history. Much of that curriculum is still part of what we're teaching in the high school today. And so without anything further, I thank you, David, for agreeing to do this. We have almost 200 participants today on the call, and we look very much forward to hearing what you say. I'm just letting everybody know that the only people that will be seen today on camera will be David Bernstein, and you're all going to be on mute as well. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and you're welcome to pose questions, and Dr. Bernstein will either answer them if they're very relevant to the moment of what he's saying while he's speaking, or at the end, we will take some of the questions and try and answer them as we can. Again, thank you all for being on with us today, Dr. Bernstein. Thank you so much, Kenny. It's a special treat to see you, and uh, I'm sure many others whom I taught either at Ramaz uh, or worked with at KJ or saw in Poland or other places where I've taken KJ and Ramaz in the past. I'd like to dedicate uh, this session to the memory of my four grandparents and my aunt, Polish Jews who were murdered by the Nazis uh, before I was able to get to know them. So, Yom HaShoah begins tomorrow evening and it's a time to remember the victims of the Shoah. The number six million is a problem. Like most statistics, it leaves us cold. It may not even be the actual number. We don't know the actual number of Jews killed in the Shoah. Professor Yehuda Bauer, the Dean of Holocaust Historians here in Israel and at Yad Vashem, estimates the number is probably closer to five and a half million. The enormity of that number is just too much for us to grasp. Uh, some of you have seen the film Paper Clips. Um, some of you in this audience may remember one Yom HaShoah Ramaz when I was teaching there. We organized, in those days it was dot matrix computers that we were using. We organized an X for, Kenny remembers, for 
uh, 1 million X's. We didn't even get to 6 million. Uh, 1 million X's were plastered over the entire lobby. I, it was just, it was overwhelming. Joseph Stalin, who rivals Hitler as the greatest mass murderer in history, or one of the greatest, Joseph Stalin once said, the death of one person is a tragedy, the death of a million is a statistic. And he was right. One way to try to get a grip on those numbers is that of all of the nations that fought in World War II, some of whom suffered millions of casualties, all of them have made up their population losses except for the Jewish people. There was an article today in the Times of Israel claiming that we're finally 75 years later approaching the number of Jews that existed in the world in 1939. And Professor Sergio Della Pergola of Hebrew University estimates that if not for the Shoah, Jewish population today would not be 15 million in the world, it would probably be something more like 35 million. We were 0.8% of the world's population in 1939, 0.8%. Today we are closer to 0.2%. I know sometimes it doesn't seem like that to us who live in the Jewish world and are so attached to the Jewish community. 99.8% of the world is not Jewish. Only 0.2% is. And at one point in 1939, it was 0.8%. All too often memory is stuck on the death and the murders and not on the lives of those who died in the Shoah. I don't think that gives full honor to their memory, especially as the Jews of Eastern Europe, the overwhelming majority of the victims of the final solution, had created a vibrant and diverse community in response to modernity. Yes, there were still the Tevyas, and there were still the Golders, as in Fiddler on the Roof, but there was much, much more in East European Jewry, and we'll focus on Polish Jewry, and in particular, Warsaw Jewry, in the interwar years. For centuries, the Polish Jewish community was the largest in the world. I imagine if I asked for a show of hands, which I can't see at this moment, and I asked how many of you trace your origins to Poland or to Russia, I would imagine the vast majority of you would raise your hands accepting Jews of Sephardic background. It was only with the mass immigration of two million Jews from Eastern Europe to the United States in the late 1800s and early 1900s that the United States came to surpass Poland in Jewish population. In 1939, on the eve of World War II, there were approximately 3.3 million Jews living in Poland, the largest Jewish community in the world except for the United States. 90% of them, or maybe it's better if I say nine out of 10 would be murdered in the next six years. What I'd like to do is focus on the lives of some individuals who may represent the breadth of Polish Jewish experience in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s. Warsaw in the early 1900s was arguably the most important Jewish community in the world. If second to New York in numbers, it was second to none in terms of Jewish cultural leadership. It's Yeshivot and Beit Midrash, Batei Midrash, it's Jewish newspapers, it's Yiddish theater, and even it's budding Yiddish movie industry. It's Jewish political parties, ranging from the Yaguda, Agudat Yisrael, the Haredi party, to the Mizrahi, the religious Zionists, to the socialist Zionists, to the Bundists, which was the largest socialist group in Poland. Each of these parties had their own youth movements, summer camps, publications, often they had their own schools. Warsaw was in many ways the heart of all of these movements and central to the Jewish world. There were almost 400,000 Jews living in Warsaw in 1939. They made up about a third of the population. I like to compare it to New York, 
New York, the most Jewish city in the diaspora, which the anti-Semites like to call Jew York. At its height, the height of Jewish population in New York, before the flight to the suburbs, New York was 28% Jewish. Warsaw was 33% Jewish, more Jewish than New York. So what I'd like to do in the next 45 minutes or so is to focus on a number of Jewish Warsaw personalities who lived during this time period, who provide a taste of the richness, the diversity of a modernizing Jewish community, most of whom had no idea that in a few years, it would be no more. Leah, we can turn to the slideshow. We start our virtual walking tour, and I'm sorry we can't be doing this in person. We start our virtual walking tour, walking to an Ohel, a small building where the Nitziv, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, and his colleague from the Yeshiva of Elijah, Reb Chaim Salavechik, are buried together. We can go to the next slide. We'll focus first on the Nitziv, Rav Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. As you could see, his life spans more or less the 19th century. He was the Rosh Yeshiva, but was arguably the most important Yeshiva in the world at the time, certainly in the Ashkenazic world, the Volusian Yeshiva, larger than any other Yeshiva during its time period, founded by Reb Chaim of Volusian, the Talmud Mufhak, the prime disciple of the Vilna Gaon. And the Nitziv was the Rosh Yeshiva of Volusian for longer than anyone else, almost 40 years. He was a very beloved Rosh Yeshiva. Chaim Nachman Bialik, who was one of his students, writes very lovingly about the care that the Rosh Yeshiva had for his students. Another one of the illustrious students of Elijah was Rav Avraham Yitzchak Akoin Cook, who would later become the first chief rabbi of Eretz Yisrael of Palestine at the time. There's a legend about the Nitziv that as a young boy, he was not into his learning. He was not especially studious. He was not one of those iluyim, one of those young prodigies that at an early age, everybody understood would be a gadol ador. And according to the legend, he heard his parents speaking and the malamid came and said to the parents, you know, he's a very nice boy. He's not so studious, doesn't so such promise. Maybe you should teach him a trade. Maybe you should become a shoemaker. And according to the legend, the Nitziv overheard this conversation and resolved that he was going to make his parents proud, knowing how much they cared deeply about Torah learning. And so he represents in many ways the ideal of hatmada, hasmada, the idea of zitzflesh, the ability to sit long hours in order to achieve greatness in learning. He was an ardent Zionist, one of the leaders of the Chibat Zion movement, the Chovevei Zion. He was also someone who was very deeply against any split in the community. For those of you who know the Hungarian Jewish community, you know that that community split as modernists began to move away from religious observance, the Nitziv was against having that happen in Eastern Europe, in his communities. He said it would be like a dagger in the heart of the Jewish community. He loved Tanakh. He taught a daily Chumashir in Volusian, something that was quite unusual uh, at that time in Yeshivot. And he wrote a perush on the Chumash, Ha'emek Davar, uh, which uh, I don't think has been translated into English, but it's quite popular here in Israel. The Nitziv had two sons. One was named Chaim, and it's after him that Yeshivat Chaim Berlin is named. 
The second was named Mayer. And Mayer, like his father, was an ardent Zionist, made Aliyah. And the university that we know as Bar Ilan is named for him because he Hebraicized his name from Mayer Berlin to Mayer Bar Ilan, son of the Nitziv. The Nitziv was also the last Rosh Yeshiva. The Velazhin Yeshiva was closed. Uh, the Russian authorities, the czarist authorities at the time insisted uh, on all sorts of restrictions. The teachers had to have degrees, academic degrees. Uh, the uh, Tova learning could only take place in the late afternoon and evening hours and only a limited amount of Tova learning could take place. Uh, and uh, the Nitziv closed the yeshiva. If we go to the next slide, buried next to him, is Reb Chaim Salavechik, Reb Chaim of Brisk. Reb Chaim Salavechik, the grandfather of the Rav, Rav Yosef Tov Ber Salavechik of Yeshiva University, whose yurtzeit was just observed less than a week ago. Reb Chaim Salavechik, Reb Chaim of Brisk, also was a Ram, a, a Rosh Metivta, a Rosh Yeshiva, uh, a, a lecturer in Talmud at Volusian. But he's known for his time later in Brisk. Uh, and some of you may have heard of the Brisker method of Talmud study that he developed. He was also somebody whose personality uh, was uh, truly remarkable. Um, it said, uh, perhaps true, perhaps not true, that three great rabbis in the early 1900s in Eastern Europe were asked, what is the most important function of a Rav? The Nitziv answered to teach Torah. The Dubno Magid said to give inspiring drashot, sermons. But Reb Chaim Salavechik said, the most important role of a Rav is to protect the widow, the orphans, and the poor. And when I, ever, when I take people on a real tour of the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery, I always quote Rabbi Haskell Lukstein, who, uh, when I went with him for the first time there, made a beautiful addition that I've incorporated into my guiding. If you look at the book Halachic Man by uh, Rav Soloveitchik of Yeshiva University, he writes about his grandfather, Reb Chaim, and he tells a story about how one day there was uh, a shoemaker who died in the town of Brisk, a poor man. And shortly thereafter, a very wealthy member of the community passed away. And the members of the Hever Kedisha were approached by the family of the wealthy deceased person and were given a handsome sum of money to bury their relative first, because that would be greater covered to bury someone as quickly as possible. Reb Chaim heard about this and he was outraged because the poor man, who could advocate for his burial? He died first, he should be buried first. The Hever Kedisha ignored him. Finally, Reb Chaim took his walking stick went over to the Hever Kedisha, shooed them away, and insisted that the shoemaker would be buried first. Rav Salavechik writes in Halachic Man that Rav Chaim's enemies multiplied. Think about it for a moment. That wealthy family, they were probably among his supporters. And yet for him, the most important job of a Rav was to protect the widows, the orphans, and the poor. So let's move on to the next slide. We walk over to the grave of Ludwig Zamenhof. We're going from, in a sense, almost one extreme to another, from the ivory tower of Tover learning. I shouldn't really say ivory tower, 
both the Nitziv and Reb Chaim were very involved in their communities. But from the heights of Torah learning and chesed in a Torah way, we come to Ludwig Zamenhof, not an evil person, but someone who represents a very different strain of Polish Jewry, a very different ideology. Zamenhof was born in Bialystok in 1859. He dies in Warsaw in 1917, shortly after Reb Chaim. And Ludwig Zamenhof had a dream. His dream was nothing less than world peace. And his thinking was that there's war because people speak different languages and belong to different nationalities. If only, thought Zamenhof, who by the way was an ophthalmologist, Dr. Zamenhof, if only he thought everyone could unite around one language, if everyone spoke one universal language, nationalism would disappear and so would war and peace would be upon us. And so he develops a language called Esperanto. And in fact, if you can make out uh, the inscription on his Matseva, you could see that it's written actually in Esperanto. It's not written in a language you would understand. He translated the Tanakh into Esperanto. And the Esperanto speakers of the world would gather in international congresses. And when they would gather, they would all speak only Esperanto, except during lunch. During the lunch break, people would revert to their regular language. And of course, the vast majority of Esperanto speakers would revert to Yiddish because so many of them were Jewish. He was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, which he never received. Leah, if we go to the next slide, you can see a picture of him. And you can see, by the way, the pin that he's wearing that has five stars. If we go back a slide, Leah, uh, we go back to the kever. You could see there's also a five-pointed star. It's not a Magain David, that would be six-pointed. The five-pointed star is the five continents of the world with the E standing for Esperanto, uniting all of them. Let's go back to his picture. He and his wife, Clara, raised three children. They all perished in the Shoah. There's a minor planet named for him and streets in many countries. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that in Tel Aviv, there's a street named for him. And here you see in Esperanto, under the dates, right? Creator of the international language Esperanto. Um, there are streets named after him in Poland, Lithuania, France, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Italy, Brazil, and of course in Israel. Uh, if you read uh, Michael Chabon's Jewish Policeman's Union, uh, a lot of the action takes place in the Hotel Zamenhof. Uh, that's where the detective Lanzmann lives. Let's continue on our walking tour. And we'll go to the next slide. We come here to uh, not a kever, but a monument. And it's a monument uh, of a ghetto fighter. But you'll notice that here, the Matsevot are red, red sandstone. This is a section of Bundists. The Bund was uh, a party founded by uh, East European Jews in Vilna in 1897. They were socialists, they were Yiddishists. They believed in creating the socialist revolution. And by doing so, they would end anti Semitism and depression of all peoples. They believed that Jews would have cultural autonomy with Yiddish as the basis of their culture in that future utopian society. And the color red represents red, the socialist color. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see actually a, a more recent uh, Matseva from 2009 of Marek Edelman. Marek Edelman was actually one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
uh, along with Mordechai Nilevich and Victor uh, and uh, uh, Peter, Piotr Frankel. Uh, Marek Edelman uh, stayed in Poland. Unlike most survivors, he stayed in Poland after the war. He was uh, a socialist. And so the communist government was not so alien to him, at least in the beginning. Uh, later on, he achieves a good deal of uh, fame in Poland. Uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is viewed as a very heroic thing by Poles. Uh, and the annual ceremony that's held at the site uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto is uh, always attended by Polish officials. Uh, when he came out in favor of the solidarity movement against the communists, it was an important moral voice uh, that supported the solidarity movement against the communist regime. And ultimately, as you know, it was in Poland uh, that communism began to fall in Eastern Europe in 1989. Let's go on to the next slide. We're continuing our tour and we come to Ohel Peretz. The Peretz Ohel. Uh, buried there are three Yiddish writers, Yaakov Denizin, uh, Shlom, uh, I'm blanking now, the author of the Dybbuk, uh, Shlomo, not Rappaport, but I'm blanking, I'll think of it in a while, sorry. Uh, and most importantly, Yud Lamed Peretz, and that's who we're going to focus on. Yud Lamed Peretz was born in 18... 1852, we can go to the next slide and see a picture of him. Born in 1852 in Zamush, a town in southeastern Poland. Um, becomes one of the great Yiddish writers along with Shalom Aleichem and Mendela Moches Farim. Those are the three greatest Yiddish writers. Uh, Peretz uh, actually may have been of Sephardi, uh, must, may have had Sephardi ancestry. Of course, the original Jewish inhabitants of Zamush were Sfardim, uh, and uh, Peretz is a name that, uh, a last name that's much more common among Sfardi Jews than among Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, so we don't know for sure, but that would be an added irony. Peretz grows up in a religious home, uh, like most Polish Jews in the 19th century. But uh, in, at a young age already, uh, he, in the late 19th century, begins to move away from religious observance, uh, as many Polish Jews will. Uh, he moves to Warsaw in 1875. It's there that he begins to write, even though he trained as a lawyer, his love was writing. And it was actually Shalom Aleichem who published his very first work. Um, he wrote a tremendous volume of Yiddish and Hebrew writings. His Yiddish writings fill 11 volumes. His Hebrew writings fill 10 volumes. Uh, he was uh, such an important and beloved figure uh, in Poland uh, that when he died, 100,000 Jews attended his funeral. We think about that for a moment. How many people have a funeral of 100,000 people perhaps unusually great political leaders, unusually famous rabbis, but he was a writer, a Yiddish writer for the most part, and uh, Peretz was a very, very beloved figure. Ironically, uh, he uh, couldn't earn a living by his writing. Uh, his, his job was actually working in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery where he is buried. Let's go to the next slide. Yes, one more of Yud Lamed Peretz. And that brings us to Esther Rachel Kaminska. Esther Rachel Kaminska, uh, who was born in 1878 and dies in 1925. Esther Rachel Kaminska was, uh, together with her husband, the founder of a Yiddish theater group that traveled not only all over Poland, but actually traveled all over Western Europe and, actual, and into uh, the Soviet Union, into Tsarist Russia and then the Soviet Union, and actually came to America as well. 
It was the most famous of the Yiddish theater groups. Esther Rachel, if we can go to the next slide, where you can see a picture of her. Esther Rachel acted in many, many Yiddish plays. Some of them were by European writers, the great European writers like Ibsen and Dumas. But she also acted in many particularly Yiddish plays written specifically for the Yiddish stage. And in those uh, plays, her most famous role was that of a Jewish mother. If we can go to the next slide, you can actually see her with her daughter. We'll come to the, her daughter in a minute. Um, but Esther Rachel was known as Mama Esther Rachel Kaminska. If we go back a couple of slides to the, uh, you can see it says, under the, uh, the, the inscription between the dates, Mama Esther Rachel Kaminska, um, because of her famous roles as a Jewish mother. Let's go back to uh, the picture of her with her daughter. Um, about half a million tickets were sold to the Yiddish theater in 1937 in Warsaw alone. Yiddish theater was a very, very big thing. And as you could see from this slide, excuse me, by the 1920s, there was a Yiddish film industry that was developing, centered of course in Poland. Uh, that Yiddish film industry of course was cut down by the Shoah and never really revived. Here we could see next to Esther Rachel, her daughter. Her daughter's name was Ida, Ida Kaminska. Uh, some of you may remember that name. Uh, Ida Kaminska acted together with her father and mother in that troupe from the time she was a child. And if we can go to the next slide, right, you could see uh, Ida Kaminska there um, in the title role of Mirala Efros, uh, a very, very famous Yiddish play. Uh, Ida Kaminska survives the war by fleeing to the Soviet Union. That is how most Polish Jews who survived managed to survive. If we say 90% of Polish Jews were killed, roughly 3 million of the 6 million were Polish Jews. About 300,000 of them survived. About 250,000 of those 300,000, meaning five out of six Polish Jewish survivors survived by fleeing to the Soviet Union. My parents were among them. Only about 50,000 Jews, Polish Jews, managed to survive the war in Poland, either in hiding or in camps, or pretending to be Christians. After the war, Ida Kaminska comes back to Poland. And when she comes back, she reestablishes the Yiddish theater for the small remnant of the Polish Jewish community. But in the mid 1950s, there's an anti-Semitic campaign by the Polish communist regime. She flees and comes to the United States. And there she acted on the Yiddish theater on Second Avenue uh, and uh, actually was even in a film uh, called The Shop on Main Street in 1967. Esther Rachel Kaminska also had a son. His name was Yosef. And Yosef made Aliyah in 1937 and became a violinist in the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra. So it was a very, very talented family, as you could tell. Let's go to the next slide. The next slide, I don't think he's buried in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. But while we're talking about Yiddish culture and uh, literature and theater and movies, I want to come to Vladislav Spielmann. If you've seen the movie, The Pianist, then that's the story of Vladislav or Vladik Spielmann. Uh, Spielmann was born in 1911. He studied piano both in Warsaw and Berlin. And in 1935 joined the Polish radio. We performed classical music as well as jazz music on the Polish radio. Uh, 
He went to the ghetto in 1940, and he played in the restaurants of the wealthy smugglers uh, in the ghetto, and that's how he survived the ghetto years. His family was sent to Treblinka, like most of Warsaw Jewry, but he was saved by a Jewish policeman in Warsaw. He was hidden by the Polish underground. And ultimately, if you remember the film, there's a German army officer who helps him as well. That army officer was given the title of Righteous Among the Nations. His memoirs were published about 30 years after the war. And the film that came out in 2002, shortly after his death, uh, won many of the Oscars that year, best film, uh, best director, best actor, et cetera. This, this tells us, why do I bring in Spielman now? Because it tells us that Jews were not only producing Jewish culture, they were an important part of secular Polish culture as well. Let's move on. When we come to the Eish Kodesh, I hope you're understanding this mosaic of people who all lived together in the Polish Jewish community <clears throat> in the decades before the war, and some of them during the war as well. The Eish Kodesh, the Piasechna Rebbe of Kalman Kalanimis Shapiro. Uh, the Piasechna Rebbe was born in 1889, which means that he, he was 50 years old when the war broke out. He was the Rebbe of a uh, community just outside of Warsaw, Piasechna, and it's, hence he's called the Piasechna Rebbe. He was a Rosh Yeshiva <clears throat> of a Yeshiva called Das Moshe. And he's somebody whose works have become very, very popular lately. Um, really only in the last decade or two have his works become very popular. Uh, they've become almost mandatory for yeshiva students in Israel. Um, Chovot Talmidim, uh, in which he writes about the obligations of a yeshiva student. Uh, one of the things that he writes that I think is so beautiful there is about how everyone has a contribution to make to the Beit Midrash. For some people, it's their learning. For other people, it's the way they encourage other people. For other people, it's just being helpful. It's being friendly. It's creating community. It's being an example of a life of chesed. In fact, there's a story that Shlomo Kalbach tells about a street sweeper in Tel Aviv who was a student of the Eish Kodesh and survived the war. And the street sweeper told him that what the Eish Kodesh taught more than anything else was, quote, the most important thing you can do is to help another human being, end quote. It's interesting that the Eish Kodesh writes in his writings about how Jews are moving away from religious observance. Sometimes we have this uh, idyllic image in the religious community that everybody was from in Poland, which I, I hope that your understanding wasn't true, even though it was still a great center of Torah. There were many Jews, particularly young Jews, who were moving away from religious observance. And he writes about uh, how instead of um, harsh discipline and rote learning. What teachers need to do is, quote, to learn to speak the language of the student and graphically convey the delights of a life of closeness to God. <clears throat> he argued that every child must be imbued with a vision that he has something special to give the world and to give the Torah world as an active participant in his own development. These were very progressive ideas uh, in his time, and one could argue even today. Yesh Kodesh also advocated meditation. Uh, and uh, there are, among uh, those uh, who are committed to Jewish spirituality, the Piyasechna Rebbe is actually a very great hero, and they use some of his methods 
uh, to try to uh, incorporate Jewish meditation uh, in their practice. His only son was killed in the Nazi bombing of Warsaw in September 1939, and he is buried in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. His only daughter was uh, taken away in the great deportations of the summer of 1942 to Treblinka. The Yesh Kodesh himself manages to live through the ghetto period until 1943. And he spends his time in the Warsaw Ghetto <clears throat> constantly trying to imbue faith and optimism and continued loyalty to Torah and mitzvot to his followers. And every Shabbos, he would give a drasha. And after Shabbat, he would write down the notes of what he said. And the notes of what he said were given over to the Einig Shabbos archival group, whom we'll talk about later, hidden in metal milk cans and tin boxes, among tens of thousands of other documents. His drashot were discovered after the war and were named Eish Kodesh, Holy Fire. He is eventually deported to Travniki, uh, a camp not far from Majdanek, not far from Lublin. And we believe he was killed in the Erntefest, what the Germans called the Harvest Festival, the murder of about 40,000 Jews in a period of three days in November 1943. Let's go to the next slide. Janusz Korczak. Janusz Korczak was born Henrik, Gold, uh, Henrik Goldschmidt in 1878. And this, what we're seeing in this slide, is a memorial to him in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery. Uh, Korczak was a doctor. He was a pediatrician. Uh, and he wrote, I am a doctor by education, <clears throat> a pedagogue by chance, a writer by passion, and a psychologist by necessity. If we can go to the next slide, there's a picture of Korchak. Korchak combined his storytelling abilities and his medical tal talents to become a, a remarkable progressive educator. He was Poland's Dr. Spock. When I say Dr. Spock, uh, I'm talking about Dr. Benjamin Spock, uh, the one who authored Baby and Child Care, uh, the, uh, the book that sold tens of min millions of copies in America, and the baby boomers were for the most part raised on Dr. Spock's advice. Dr. Janusz Korczak was the Dr. Spock of interwar Poland. In addition to writing, he also <clears throat> had a radio show. Uh, and he took the pseudonym, Dr. Janusz Korczak, which sounds like the name of a Polish nobleman, because he was not so uh, comfortable having such a Jewish name, Henrik Goldschmidt. He was afraid that people might uh, ignore him, might dismiss him because he was Jewish uh, in interwar Poland, which uh, had a great deal of anti-Semitism. Um, I used to uh, see that as a kind of a Polish thing, and then I remembered Gee whiz, how about all those Jewish celebrities in the interwar years and into the 1950s and 60s, all those Jewish celebrities who also changed their names uh, so as not to appear to be too Jewish. Uh, so it wasn't only in Poland. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can see a picture of his orphanage, the building of his orphanage. Korczak organized <clears throat> a Jewish orphanage, and by popular demand, then a Catholic orphanage. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, when the Nazis created the ghetto in Warsaw, being an important personality, he was offered the opportunity to escape, to go into hiding, um, but he refused to abandon his Jewish orphans, and he took them into the ghetto with him. Better yet, he accompanied them to the ghetto where he worked tirelessly 
to make sure they had enough food. Not an easy thing to do in the ghetto. Finally, in the summer of 1942, in the great deportations, he and his orphans are deported to Treblinka. And there are eyewitnesses who write about the march to the Umschlagplatz, that loading area where Warsaw Jury was put on trains to the death camp of Treblinka. He has one eyewitness report. I'll never forget the sight to the end of my life. It wasn't just entering a boxcar. It was a silent but organized protest against the murderers, a march like which no human eye had ever seen before. Let's go back to the, uh, Leah, let's go back to the one before, the memorial. This is meant to depict Korchak leading the children to the Jumschlagplatz. Korchak went first with his head held high, leading a child with each hand. They went to their death with such a look of contempt for their assassins. When the ghetto policemen saw Korchak, they snapped to attention and saluted. Who is that man, asked the Germans. I couldn't control myself any longer, but I hid the flood of tears that ran down my cheeks with my hands. I sobbed at our helplessness in the face of such murder. Let's go back. Let's go forward. Yes, one more. And here we can see in Treblinka, <clears throat> some of you have been with me to Treblinka. In Treblinka, there are 17,000 stones. A few hundred of them have the name of a community that was deported to Treblinka on it. The only stone that has the name of an individual on it is that of Janusz Korczak, who is a Jewish hero and was used in Poland as a great hero as well. We're reaching uh, the end of our tour, our walking tour. Let's go to the next slide. Emmanuel Ringelblum really one of my heroes. Manuel Ringelblum, born in 1900 in Buczac, in Galicia, in Poland, not far from my parents' hometown of Brody. Born into a religious Zionist home, he moved away from religious observance like many of his compatriots. But he was deeply Jewish. He studied Jewish history, earned a PhD, Actually, the subject of his dissertation was the history of the Jews of Warsaw, where he took up residence. When about 10,000 Ostjuden, Jews from the East, were expelled from Nazi Germany in 1938, Ringelblum organized aid for the refugees. But he did so in a way that reflected his political views, being a socialist Zionist. And that was he believed in people, in the common man, in the common people. And so he called it a line health, self-help. He didn't believe the philanthropists should determine what the poor people needed. He believed that the poor people themselves would know best what they needed. And when the ghetto was formed in 1940, Ringelblum was already writing a diary that he had started when the war began in 1939. But when he came into the ghetto, he began a project like no other in the entire annals of the Shoah. He gathered around him about 60 men and women, a diverse group, rabbis and atheists, professors, poets, simple people. And he gathered them around in order to collect every piece of evidence they could about what was happening in the Warsaw Ghetto. The biography of Emanuel Ringelblum that came out about five or 10 years ago by Professor Sam Cassow is called, Who Will Write Our History? Because Ringelblum's greatest fear was that the Nazis would write the history of the Warsaw Ghetto. First and foremost, he wanted to record Jewish suffering and Nazi atrocities. But these 60 men and women also managed to find out about many other Jewish communities in Poland and what was happening to them. It was the Oynik Shabbos group that was able to get word out to the BBC in 1942 
about the murders, the mass murders of Polish Jewry. And the BBC actually broadcast that 700,000 Polish Jews have been murdered up to that point. Ringel Bloom, though not religious, said, I ought to go to the mikveh every morning. Like a sofer stam, like a Torah scribe, because God forbid I should get even one letter, one word wrong in the work that I am doing. It's because of Ringelblum and the Oinik Shabbos group. And of course, because of the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, that we know so much about the Warsaw Ghetto. If we can move to the next slide, you can see there's an Israeli post stamp honoring Ringelblum. Let's go one more. The milk cans and tin boxes that contain the archives, that contain the documents, and if you've been to Yad Vashem, or if you've been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, you've seen those metal milk cans. Let's go one more. This is after the war, when they were discovered. And I want to just finish about Ringelblum. He, his wife, and their young son escaped from the ghetto. And they're hidden in the Polish Catholic side of Warsaw by a Polish Catholic family. Unfortunately, the daughter of the family broke up with her Polish Catholic boyfriend. And that boyfriend, in order to exact revenge, informed that the family was hiding about 30 Jews on the outskirts of Warsaw on a farm. Ringo Bloom among them. Ringo Bloom and his family were taken to the Paviak prison. The Polish couple was murdered. And while he was in the Paviak prison with his young son, Uriel, who was, I believe, six or seven years old at the time, a member of the underground reaches him and tells him, we can get you out. We can say we need a shoemaker and we can get you out. And Ringo Bloom said to the underground messenger, what about my son Uriel? What about my wife in the women's prison? The underground courier was silent because they could get him out, but they could never get out his son or his wife. Ringo Bloom, the courier reports, Ringo Bloom understood the silence. And he said, if that's the case, I prefer to go the way of Kiddush Hashem. Of those 60 members of Einik Shabbos, 57 of them were murdered. Only three of them survived. Two of them are in this picture, Hirschwasser and his wife Bluma, standing next to those tin boxes when they were discovered after the war. There were three treasure troves. The first was discovered by Hirschwasser and his wife Bluma, and an archaeological team that did a dig amongst the rubble of the Warsaw Ghetto. The second treasure trove was found accidentally by Polish construction workers around 1950. And the third treasure trove has never been found. Let's go to the next which is our last picture and our next to last slide. Rachel Eierbach is the third of the three survivors of the Yonik Shabbos group. She was born, as you see, in 1903. And she moved to Warsaw. And uh, in Warsaw, she was a writer, a journalist. And in the ghetto period, she ran a soup kitchen and she describes the terrible dilemmas in that soup kitchen with not enough food to feed those who would come in. And the dilemma of what to do, give everyone an equal portion to favor the young, to favor the healthy and give them double portions 
She was also a member of Oynik Shabbos and a close associate, associate of Emmanuel Ringel Bloom. Rachel Ayerbach survives the war. And she stays in Poland after the war for a few years. One of her first stops after liberation. She was saved by a Catholic family, by the way, when she escaped from the ghetto in Warsaw. One of her first stops after the liberation was to go to Treblinka, where so many of her family members and so many of her friends had been murdered. And she describes what she calls the Treblinka gold rush. What is she describing? Dozens of Polish peasants digging all over Treblinka, looking for Jewish gold. As the communists take power, she leaves Poland in 1950. She makes her way to Israel. And there she becomes the founding director at Yad Vashem of the Department for the Collection of Witness Testimony. The whole project of witness testimony is begun by Rachel Arbach. And she gave three reasons for her work. One was, of course, to memorialize all of the victims. Second, she felt that the witness testimony was cathartic for the witnesses, the survivors. And third, she wanted to collect evidence to bring the Nazi criminals to justice. She testified at the Eichmann trial and she gathered witness testimonies of others for the, for the Eichmann trial as well in 1961. She died in Israel. Now I wanna to go to our last slide and conclude with this. This is written by one of the members of Einik Shabbos. His name was Israel Lichtenstein. With zeal and zest, I threw myself into the work to help assemble archive materials. I was entrusted to be the custodian. I hid the material. Besides me, no one knew. I confided only in my friend Hirsch Wasser, my superior. Remember Hirsch Wasser from the picture with the tin boxes. It is well hidden. Please God that it be preserved. That will be the finest and best that we achieved in the present gruesome time. I know that we will not endure. To survive and remain alive after such horrible murders and massacres is impossible. Therefore, I write this testament of mine. Perhaps I'm not worthy of being remembered, but just for my grit in working with the society Yonik Shabbos and for being the most endangered because I hid the entire material. It would be a small thing to give my own head. I risk the head of my dear wife, Gela Sextine, and my treasure, my little daughter, Margalit. I don't want any gratitude, any monument, any praise. I want only a remembrance so that my family, brother and sister abroad, may know what has become of my remains. I want my wife to be remembered. Gela Sextine, artist, dozens of works, talented, didn't manage to exhibit, did not show in public. During the three years of war, worked among children as an educator, teacher, made stage sets, costumes for the children's productions, received awards. Now together with me, we are preparing to receive death. I want my little daughter to be remembered. Margalit, 20 months old today, has mastered Yiddish perfectly, speaks a pure Yiddish. At nine months began to speak Yiddish clearly. In intelligence, she is on a par with three or four year old children. I don't wanna brag about her. Witnesses to this who tell me about it are the teaching staff of the school at Novolipki 68. By the way, that's where he hid the first treasure trove of documents under the basement of his daughter's nursery school at Novolipki 68. I am not sorry about my life and that of my wife, but I am sorry for the gifted little girl. She deserves to be remembered also. May we be the redeemers for all the rest of the Jews in the whole world. I believe in the survival of our people Jews will not be annihilated. We, the Jews of Poland, Czechoslovakia, Lithuania, Latvia, are the scapegoat for all Israel 
in all the other lands. Dated July 31st, 1942, the 11th day of the great deportations. We remember Israel Lichtenstein today, 78 years later. I remember him here in Jerusalem. Those of you in New York, you remember him in New York and those of you in other places in Israel and elsewhere, we remember him 78 years later. And we remember his wife, Gela Sextine. And we remember his daughter, Marguerite. His last wish was a remembrance. And we remember him 78 years later today in Yerushalayim, in New York, and elsewhere. Thank you very much. Dr. Bernstein, I think you've probably left all of us speechless. Um, this was more uh, powerful than one can imagine, having walked, as I said, the cemetery with you in, in Warsaw. You really brought to life so much of what we've experienced and uh, what we're feeling and thinking about, certainly as Yom HaShoah approaches quickly. There were some questions, and I would uh, just ask if you would, uh, I'll take a couple of them that were written. One of the questions that came up a couple of times is about the Warsaw Cemetery itself and how it stayed intact, and then when was it actually restored and by whom? Hmm. Good questions. Uh, the Warsaw Cemetery dates from the very first years of the 1800s. Um, Jews had been expelled from Warsaw and lived across the river in an area called Praga, not Prague, but Praga. Um, they were admitted back in the 1790s into the city proper. And so they established a, ce a cemetery uh, in, I think it was 1806 or 1805, something like that. Um, the, uh, the cemetery was not destroyed by the Nazis. Um, I'm sorry to say the Nazis spent more time murdering the Jews of Warsaw than destroying the cemetery in Warsaw. There was some damage done, but it's an enormous cemetery. There are 250,000 Jews buried there. Um, and uh, the Nazis did not spend most of their time destroying that cemetery. Uh, it's only been partially restored. Um, there's a lot of restoration on an ongoing basis. Uh, the Polish uh, municipality of Warsaw is involved in the restoration and Jewish donations from abroad are also involved in the restoration. Uh, thank you. Um, also, uh, the question came up, you, you talked about a couple of the remarkable women of the time in Warsaw. Is there any data on the uh, the women that were um, that that came to become famous in terms of the areas and the specialties that they had, or the areas that they became well known in. I'm not sure what the question is about data. It, it, um, about the they um, data about the remarkable women of the communities in Warsaw during that time. Yeah, I mean, I, like like most uh, most of history before the contemporary period, you usually have to look a little bit deeper. Uh, and look a little bit harder to find out the, uh, the stories of women uh, as men played such a prominent role uh, as leaders in society. Uh, one of the things I like to do that we couldn't do here is actually to, uh, if, we, if we were in the Warsaw Jewish Cemetery, to just stop at a few simple Jews, men and women, uh, and see something about their life through the epitaphs that are written the inscriptions that are written uh, on those uh, matzivot. Um, some people were asking about the works of Peretz and if they are translated into English and if you had a yes. recommendation for a specific book for someone to read. Um, I imagine that you can find some of the stories online. Um, and uh, certainly there are books, you know, in English about Peretz. I don't have a title in particular to give you. Uh, the story that's my favorite is Imlo uh, Lamala Mizer, if not higher, uh, which those of you who've come with me to Poland, I always tell that story at uh, Peretz's grave. But he's, I think his most famous story is Buncha Schweig, uh, Buncha the Silent, uh, about a very humble, meek Jew. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's, he's really nobody special in the sense of a leadership or learning. Um, and 
you know, that's probably his, his most famous work. Um, but uh, there are, I, I think you could find some of his stories online, translated into English. You'll Wonderful. enjoy them. Okay. Um, thank you once again. I want to express um, many, many people wrote in just wanting to say thank you and that you were their best teacher when uh, they were in Ramaz and you continue to uh, inspire them. So uh, on their behalf, I say thank you. And on our behalf, on, the, on behalf of Ramaz and KJ, uh, David Bernstein, you continue to uh, give us so much of yourself and, and what you are all about. We're so proud that you continue to be part of the Ramaz KJ family you, Ricky, and your children. And we hope, please God, uh, to share happy moments with you as we have in the past. Uh, so thank you very, very much for being with us. Uh, for those that are still on with us, just wanted to remind you that tomorrow evening, um, April 20th at 7 p.m., we will have our uh, official community Yom HaShoah programming where life leads you stories of the Staten, Staten Island uh, uh, Holocaust survivors. And that program will be at seven o'clock. All of the information will be sent out. You'll also be receiving information about the celebrations of Yom Hazikaron, of the commemoration of Yom Hazikaron into the celebration of Yom HaAtzma'ut, the Tekes Ma'avar that we will have as a community. And we will also give entree to all of you to the opportunity to see how Ramaz in all the different divisions will be celebrating Yom HaAtzma'ut. And we will be sending out Zoom links for you to be able to be part of those celebrations as well, both during the day and the evening. I wish you all health, safety, and thank you very much for being on this Zoom with us today. Have a good one.